verses 30 through 37. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you argu arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he had placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the God, Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Would you consider yourself a competitive person? Or maybe I should ask, in what ways are you competitive? Maybe you're com competitive in getting the best grades in your class or the best parking place at work or at the grocery store. Maybe you compete to make the best pancakes in your family or to tell the funniest stories or not knock jokes or to get up the earliest on Christmas morning. Humans are naturally competitive. We like to have an edge over those around us. Rabbi Harold Kushner tells the story of a driven young man in a pre-med program at a competitive college. The summer before his junior year, the young man took a break from his studies to travel the Far East. He met a guru who questioned his pursuit of success. The guru claimed that the young man's constant desire to compete against others was poisoning his soul. So he invited the young man to join him at his retreat center where all the students loved one another and shared their possessions. So the ambitious pre-med student called his parents and told them he was dropping out of medical school. Well, a few months later, he wrote a letter to explain his new way of life. And his letter began, Dear Mom and Dad, I know you weren't happy about my decision, but I want to tell you how it has changed me. For the first time in my life, I'm at peace. Here, there's no competing, no trying to get ahead of anyone. This way of life is so in harmony with my inner soul that only in six months, I become the number two disciple in the entire community, and I think I could be number one by June. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy to give up the need to compete, is it? There are big rewards for competition in our culture. Status promotions, paychecks, and bragging rights. But what does competition do to our soul? Well, it depends on the motivation behind the competition. A woman wrote in Reader's Digest with a story about her husband's recent golf game. Her four-year-old daughter greeted her husband at the door by asking, Daddy, who won the golf game, you or Uncle Richie? Uncle Richie and I don't play golf to win, he said. We just play to have fun. Without hesitation, she asked, okay, Daddy, who had more fun? <laughs> little kids learn. They learn to keep score. Even little kids learn that life is about winning. But if someone wins, then someone else loses. If someone is first, then someone else is second and third and last. And in our culture, we often base our identity and self-worth on whether or not we're winning. We judge our value as human beings on how close we are to being number one. But someone is always going to outrun us, outrank us, and outperform us. The greatest athlete on earth may have a lousy marriage. The richest person in the world may be in poor health. Someone always has something we want. The competition never ends. There's a story of a man who had just sat down at his favorite restaurant and ordered his favorite milkshake. 
By the time the milkshake was placed in front of him, he needed to use the restroom. So he grabbed a pen and wrote on his napkin, I am the world's strongest weightlifter, and placed the napkin under the edge of his glass. Surely no one would steal his milkshake from the world's strongest weightlifter. He returned to the table a few minutes later to find that someone had drunk his favorite milkshake. The person had also flipped over the napkin and written on the back, thanks for the treat, signed the world's fastest runner. <laughs> That's the problem. That's a problem with being a competitive person. You're always chasing after some other person, after some other record. Someone will always be greater than you. You can waste a lot of energy and lose a lot of joy by always trying to stay ahead of the other guy. Of course, Jesus understands our need to compete. He understands our desire to be the greatest. Fear and pride drive us to put our needs first and to compare ourselves to others. But fear and pride are cannibalistic urges. They may drive us to achieve great things, but they also steal away the joy of achievement and drive us further away from God and from others. Remember Jesus' words in John chapter 10, verse 10, where he said that he had come to give us a more abundant life. And when Jesus confronted his disciples in this passage today, he wasn't trying to shame them. He was trying to open their minds to the abundant life that God has made for them. And that brings us to our Bible passage for today, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. I love how Jesus, who, who has infinite knowledge of God, asks questions of us. He doesn't ask because he's ignorant. Jesus asks us questions so we can be honest with ourselves. Sometimes when we say something out loud, you realize how crazy it is. So Jesus asked his disciples, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the road, they were arguing about who was the greatest. Now, that's hilarious when you think about it, isn't it? The disciples had seen Jesus feed a crowd of thousands, heal the sick and disabled, and heal a boy who was, who was possessed by a demon, and yet they were arguing over which of them was the greatest in the group. That's like bragging to a famous chef that you finally learned how to make toast. Or telling a Navy SEAL that you fought off an attack from an aggressive butterfly on your nature walk. <laughs> Pastor Andy Court tells of an incident that happened in his adult Sunday school class one morning. The young adults were chatting about their college alma maters, and the conversation became an opportunity for some good-natured one-upmanship. Someone boasted that he went to Davidson College. Someone else said they went to Duke. And then someone else said they went to North Carolina. All of them excellent schools. But one young man remained quiet, so the students looked in his direction and asked from which school he had graduated from. And the young man said, just a little school up north. And they said, oh yeah, what was that? Yale, he replied. Have you heard of it? Well, that put the bragging to an end. The boasting for the day stopped. If I had been Jesus at the time, I would have laughed and laughed. Maybe I would have asked the disciples to explain their criteria for greatness, but Jesus didn't waste time with that. Our Bible passage today reads, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 to them and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And he took a little child whom he placed among them, and taking the child in, the, in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. One of the most popular movies in American culture is The Wizard of Oz, which came out in theaters in 1939. It may surprise you to know that The Wizard of Oz cost over $2 million to produce, but it was a flop when it came out. One movie reviewer said the movie had no trace of imagination, no good taste or ingenuity. In fact, it took 20 years after its initial theater run 
for the Wizard of Oz to make back the money that the studio spent to create it. But in the years since 1939, the movie has become incredibly popular on television. The movie studio has made a great deal more money on licensing the movie for television viewers than they ever imagined for the theater. And one of the most popular lines from this movie occurs right after the main character, Dorothy, and her little dog, Toto, have been caught up in a tornado. The tornado tears them out of their tiny Kansas farm and lands them in the magical, mythical land of Oz. And as Dorothy stares in amazement at the strange and beautiful new world around her, she blurts out, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Well, this line has become one of the movie's most quoted lines because it's such a great understated way of saying, wake up. Wake up, you're in a brand new world, and the old rules don't apply here anymore. That's exactly what Jesus, you see, is saying in our Bible passage this morning. You're not in Kansas anymore. The old rules about status and honor and greatness that matter in your culture don't matter in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how our culture defines greatness. According to Jesus... The first rule for greatness is to go where the greatest would go. And Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is the almighty God. Jesus is the great I am, the alpha and the omega in the flesh. And he gave that all up to be born into a poor family in a ho-hum little town. He gave all that up to become a carpenter. He gave all that up to spend his time working with fishermen and eating and drinking with sinners and healing the sick and the disabled. He gave up all of that to suffer an unimaginably painful and humiliating death to save us from sin and restore us to God. Where would Jesus go for us? The real question is, where wouldn't he go for us? He went from the glory of heaven to the agony of the cross to show us how much God loves us. If you really want to be the greatest, Jesus says, then go where the greatest would go. Follow him. Many years ago, an 11-year-old boy named Trevor Farrell saw a news report on the problem of homelessness in Philadelphia, his hometown. And Trevor was so concerned about the idea of people sleeping on the street that he convinced his parents to gather up as many spare blankets as they could in their home and to drive them into downtown Philadelphia. And then this young boy walked up to the first homeless person he saw and he offered her a blanket. Trevor walked up and down those streets handing out blankets until he ran out. And this was just the beginning of Trevor's mission. He convinced his parents to collect bags full of clothes and made dozens of peanut butter sandwiches to donate to the homeless folks downtown. Someone heard of Trevor's mission, and they donated a van and volunteers toward his effort. And soon, national television news programs began interviewing him. Why would an 11-year-old kid from a wealthy suburb spend his evenings and weekends making food and collecting blankets for the homeless? All Trevor could say was, it is Jesus inside of me that makes me want to do this. It's Jesus inside of me that makes me want to do this. Trevor Farrow had Jesus the greatest one of all, living inside of him. And this motivated him to go where Jesus would go, to the neediest members of his community, to share the love of Jesus with them. And the second rule of greatness is that greatness isn't about you. It's about God working through you. Read through the Bible from the beginning to the end and look very carefully at who God used to do his work. God didn't choose the strongest, the most powerful, the bravest, the smartest people to change the world. In fact, almost everyone God chose to use in his work would have been voted least likely to succeed. So how did they end up being heroes of the faith? 
they let God use them for his good works. So what would happen if you and I did the same thing? What would happen? Pastor William Henson and his wife Jean visited Plymouth, England a few years ago. And as they visited the spot where the pilgrim ships set sail for the new world, Pastor Henson recalled the words of John Robinson, the English pastor who went with them. And Robinson warned the pilgrims, I charge you to follow me only as far as you see me following Christ. Follow me only that far. Follow me only as far as you see me following Christ. Pastor John Robinson knew that the secret of greatness lies in Jesus' example. People may be impressed by our achievements, but they'll be inspired by our service. Pastor Edward Marcourt saw this kind of greatness in a member of his congregation, a man by the name of Bill Grant. Bill and his wife Mary had raised 24 foster children during their marriage. And after retiring from the restaurant business, Bill Grant joined the church mission team and traveled to Mississippi twice to help folks who were affected by hurricanes, Rita and Katrina. While the other volunteers from his church built damaged homes, rebuilt damaged homes, Bill ran the kitchen operations that fed hundreds of volunteer workers. And it was hard, hard work, but you never know it from Bill's attitude. Bill beamed with joy as he dished out food and encouragement to the volunteer workers. You also wouldn't know that while he was serving with the mission team in Mississippi, Bill Grant was battling terminal pancreatic cancer. He never told the members of his team about the fatigue and the pain that he endured every day. After he returned from his second mission trip, Bill Grant entered the hospital. And Pastor Mark Hort came to visit him. He knew that he didn't have much more time. And Pastor Mark Hort was so moved by this man's joy and his encouragement and his service on behalf of all others. To the world, you see, Bill Grant may have looked like a frail, dying old man, but in the pastor's eyes, he was a spiritual giant. Pastor Mark Hort says, I told his charged nurse, that we were in the presence of greatness when we were in Bill's hospital room. I just wanted to make sure that she understood that I just wanted the hospital staff to know who they were caring for. Why did God create you? Was it to collect paychecks, promotions, first place in the pecking order? Or was it to bring hope and life to a dying world? Greatness is defined by the greatest one of all, Jesus Christ, consists of two rules. Go where Jesus would go, to the least, to the last, to the lost, and to the lonely. And let God use you to serve those in need. Your life will have an eternal immeasurable impact if you compete to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve, and he said to them, he said, anyone who wants to be first must be very last and the servant of all. Amen.